On tonight's show, music for movies and Mozart on Mark, the 20th century boy, 20 years on. month sees the 50th anniversary of Mark Boland's birth and the 20th anniversary of the car crash that killed him. Boland was the main man, the London boy whose influence can be heard on scores of northern groups from the Smiths to Manson to Oasis. The last note he ever played was in here where he was making a six-part series for Granada called Mark. By then he was probably past his peak but with Todd Haynes film Velvet Goldmine threatening a return to the days of satin and tat, the godfather of glam could be ready for a comeback. There are those, though, who think he's never been away. I was dancing when I was 12. I was dancing when I was 12. I thought he was the most beautiful creature alive. I fell in love with him. I was dancing when I was out. When you fall in love with somebody, it leads you, and you don't know why it's happened. It's happened. And uh, I think... That was the way with Mark Bowen. I think he touched deep into the hearts of a lot of people. And I think that he did have that power to reach into both men and women's souls. Mark Bowen was born for stardom. The late 60s saw him searching for it as a hippie in the acoustic duo Tyrannosaurus Rex. He was a genuine star, someone who, who was completely charismatic. I mean, th if, he, if he worked in uh, a department store, he'd be, people would be drawn to him, even if he worked behind a county. Under Visconti, Bolin replaced Steve Tuck with Mickey Finn, shortened the band's name and went electric. The effect was immediate. Here is the only group to have two number ones last year. You saw them singing on Christmas Day, and here's the other one, T-Rex, and get it on. <laughs> I saw Mark Bolan and Mickey Finn perform the song on top of the pops and it completely changed my life. It was the most glamorous and sexy and alien thing I'd ever come across. And I can still feel that moment resonating today. Get It On was one of a string of number ones as Britain was in the grip of t rex to see. Before I knew I was, it was just on a merry-go-round and the whole thing took off beyond my wildest dreams. It was surreal, to be honest with you. You're in a, a car and there's millions of faces squashed against the car, thousands, and they're all sitting on the roof and they're going mad. And there's nothing um, real about it. The thing at the time was they were the first sign of hysteria since the Beatles. And I saw them in 72, and it seemed to be true because you couldn't hear the music. I saw them in Bellevue, in Manchester, and uh, it was just a complete mess, a very exciting mess. But you couldn't actually hear the music because people just kept screaming. Will you be a lad of car, you got a hug. At the peak of Mark's career, when we were making singles like uh, Get It On and uh, Telegram Sam, you could not open a newspaper without seeing a photo of Mark Bolin or an article about Mark Bolin. And uh, unlike the Beatles, Mark did these interviews single-handed. It was just Mark Bolin, not John, Paul, George and Ringo. And he carried it off. I mean, he had a real gift of gab and he was extremely popular. And uh, at his peak, for instance, with um, Hot Love, which or get it on. We were selling on the average of about 28,000 singles a day. Nowadays, you're lucky if you sell 28,000 a week, if it's a hit single. 28,000 singles a day, which was unprecedented. The sales figures were through the roof, outselling the Beatles in, in Britain. And uh, I, somewhere on, on record, Paul McCartney or Ringo said that uh, 
We own up, you know, T-Rex are bigger than the Beatles ever were. One, two, three, Now it was clear Bolan wasn't just the biggest star in Britain, he'd actually created a new musical genre. Until the days of glam rock, which Mark is credited with inventing, or David Bowie, depending on which history book you read first, people wore jeans, kind of lumberjack shirts, there was no glamour in, in uh, rock and roll since the days of Little Richard. Mark was the first person to put on a sequin jacket, went on stage with this look and I think single-handedly created glam rock. a lot of stuff um, these days people playing with their gender images and that's usually attributed to David Bowie whereas in fact it was Mark Bolan who started the whole thing off you know and then it was like David Bowie leapt on his bandwagon really. He did um, bisexual image if not a uh, autosexual image <laughs> and of course nobody will know what autosexuality means. I noticed that several of your songs have make references to cars the one you just uh, did, Jeepster, earlier on, the verse, there's a verse about, I wrote it down. Uh, uh, just like a car, you're pleasing to behold, I'll call you Jaguar, if I may be so bold. Uh, and uh, I'm in the animal, actually. I see. Okay. Mark, as a lyricist, was quite amazing. He would turn cars like Cadillacs and uh, Chevrolets into monsters. You know, he, they would be a special kind of a Cadillac or a, a hot rod Ford or something like that. He, uh, he, he just had the most incredible mind. He, he was in love with language and the way that he could toss syllables together and toss colour together uh, 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 and, and somehow suggest uh, sexual things and, and, and give you the idea of what it was like to have sex in a car with a couplet. This next song is called Cadillac. Mm. What can you say what it's about? Uh, it's not really about too much at all, actually. It's not about Cadillacs, for some. Nobody ever knew, understood the lyrics, I mean, it, that was never important. He didn't know what he was singing about, I'm sure. It was just all, it just sounded good. But Metal Guru was Mark's last number one. His reign was drawing to a close. His work seemed tired and his audience tired of him. David Bowie, now he changed all the time with the times. He had hit formulas, but he changed, you know, he opened them, closed them, broadened them, changed the sound, but he kept on changing. Mark thought that he had the hit formula forever, but he got slotted in the thing, a comfortable thing, that we all got tendency to do. When things are comfortable, we don't try anymore. It's like relationships, isn't it? He went downhill very, very fast. He really did lose the plot. I mean, it's terrible to say something negative about somebody who was once so great, uh, when most people in life are never great. So if somebody can give you greatness for a few years, well, you should be happy with that. But I'm afraid he did really uh, go a bit potty. Mark's career had one final flourish. In 1977, he resurfaced with his own TV show, introducing punk to a tea time audience and camp to children's television. This is a new group called uh, Generation X, who have a lead singer called Billy Idol, who's supposed to be as pretty as me. We'll see now. Generation X. Perhaps he saw a way of um, getting the face back on the screen. Perhaps he was using me, but I didn't mind, because his songs were so magical. They weren't teeny bopper in the way the other teeny boppers were completely, um, you know, well, nursery rhyme-ish almost. But Mark had magic in his work, like Ride a White Swan. Do you remember Ride a White Swan? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mystical. He was, he was a mystic, I found, and uh, in a way he had an affinity with children. Riding on out like a bird in the skyways, riding on out like you were a bird. Flying on out like an eagle in a sunbeam, riding on out like you were a bird. Uh, I met him when he was doing his Granada television shows in Manchester. 
and they say never meet your idols, but he really didn't let me down, and I, I spent the day with him there, and he kept asking me questions, asking me questions, and I couldn't think of a thing to say. I remember I played in Buzzcocks, because I, I felt Mark Boland to Buzzcocks, it was a clear link, and he loved it, you know, it's our bubblegum pump. He always had time for us, you know, and he'd always stop and say hello. And I tell you, you know, in the times that we spent outside Granada, there were a lot of other famous people who came and went who couldn't be bothered with you or did say, you know, shut up or did just blank you, whatever. And Mark always spent time. It's like he cared. He seemed to care about people regardless of who they were. Well, that's the end of show one. I hope you enjoyed it. Just remember, keep a little mark in your heart and watch the same mark time. Same Mark Channel. I dance myself out of the moon. I dance myself My brother called me six o'clock in the morning. I just couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. I dance myself into the tomb. My mum woke me up one morning. But she did a lot that year. She told me my grandma was dead and she was always three, three inches from my head. Your grand's dead. Elvis Presley's dead. Mark Boland's dead. It was a Mark Boland one that got me the most. I mean, of all cars, I know it sounds funny to be killed, it was a Mini. And he never liked small cars because he didn't go along with his status as a rock star. I think Mark Boland sort of created all periods that there should be in pop culture. So he had his periods of striving and, and trying to make it and trying to assemble his act, his art. Then he had the two years of intense kind of beauty, the great run of hit singles that I don't think it can really be, you know, there's no equal to them. And then he went sad, you know, in a, in a Presley type way. He went a bit fat, you know. He had his TV show that was a little bit embarrassing. I think it was important that that happened in a sense. You know, he lived the life. He, 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 he went for it, he had it, and then he lost it. It was the perfect story. And then he died, just what he would have wanted. So what's Boland's legacy today, apart from a loyal fan club and the inevitable tribute band? There's so many bands of today that, uh, that purely and simply are, if they admit it, Prince, I mean, Prince, man, he's, he, he's got to be a Mark Boland fan. He's got to be, there's no doubt about it, he just needs to be drawn out a little bit. Mark Bowen influenced Punky, influenced Prince, you know, right up to the present day, you know, any music you like now from Beck to Radio Hit, Radio Hit, I can hear Mark Bowen in there, I can feel that, you know, influence that he had, the, the love of life, the love of the spell of the pop single, you know, for me it was the most amazing thing because he understood that a pop, the pop song at its best is a spell. Everything's linked, and uh, you know, everybody takes from the artists they love, and eventually you develop your own individuality. But at first, you you really do sap your sap your sources dry. Was Panic a tribute to Bowen? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Wasn't it? It was um, just a little Anybody that's making a, a kind of guitar music that's still fresh, that's still sexy, you have to have a, an element of T Rex in there to make it, you know, valid as we zoom into the 21st century. Is it my Imagination. And I can always tell when they haven't. Manic Street Creatures, no T-Rex, crap, you know. Oasis, a bit of T-Rex in there, you know, okay, you know, I'll, I'll, give them, I'll give them six. Take me.